Mathematics Learning in Language Inclusive Classrooms, the title of my presentation with Joshua Sussman, a former student of mine, is an outgrowth of a design-based research project called Learning Mathematics Through Representations, or LMR. Let's see if I can make this work. So I'll be using LMR in subsequent slides to refer to this larger design-based research project. The LMR curriculum is a 19 lesson series on integers and fractions that makes use of um, the number line as a central representational context. Coordinated with the use of the number line are a host of representations. Um, these include reversible embodied actions that support meaning making on the line for kids. Um, Mathematical definitions introduced in the lessons are coordinated with um, linear and written and other kinds of representations. So order would be one mathematical definition that's introduced in the lessons. Um, intervals, like multi-unit intervals, uh, unit intervals, and subunit intervals. And, um, Symmetry is introduced as a way of um, getting kids to get, be engaged with negative number. Um, in the study that I'll summarize, we focused on 11 classrooms that were implementing this LMR curriculum and um, 10 matched comparison classrooms. In this paper, this talk, I'm going to focus on kids who were English learners, that is, English was not their native language and they were not proficient in English, as well as kids who were English proficient. Um, I'll refer to the English language learners as ELs in the subsequent slides and the English proficient students as EPs. From our perspective, the focus on um, English learners versus English proficient students is important, at least in the context of the United States. There's a well-known achievement gap between kids who are learning English and kids who are proficient in English, and our concern was to try to develop curricula that would support learning in both kinds of populations who lived in the same classrooms. So there were many contributors to the project. They included faculty, collaborating teachers, consultants, and importantly, a team of what are now former graduate students. I've organized the report in six sections. Um, first, um, I'm going to cut to the chase and present some efficacy findings, the results of our studies that show how this curriculum supported both English learners and English proficient students. Then I'm going to describe um, design-based research. Actually, these slides are very small on the screen, so I'm going to put on my glasses. Um, then I'm going to describe design-based research uh, approach um, uh, that we took. It's pretty unique to our project. Um, I'm going to then move on to lesson structures that were used throughout the lessons. Uh, I'll quickly present a broad stroke introduction to our les lesson series, the content that the lessons cover. Um, I'll move on to talk a little bit about how number line definitions, which were key to the curriculum, were introduced by one teacher in the project. And then I'll end with some conjectures about um, why might this curriculum support so well, as you'll see, English learners and English proficient students. Um, let's see. Oh, I was supposed to go through those arrows. So first, the efficacy findings. Um, I'm going to so quickly present some findings from the study, then I'll uh, go into more detail about the work. So we administered four assessments to children who were participating in the 11 LMR classrooms and the 10 comparison, matched comparison classrooms. A pre-assessment was administered before the lessons uh, began. There was an interim assessment um, that occurred after the integers lessons, but before the fractions lessons a post-assessment after the integers and fractions lessons together, and then a final assessment at the end of the year. For the interim assessment, only the LMR classrooms received that particular assessment, so you'll see a missing data point. So some quick claims. First, 
English learners gain more in, NL in LMR classrooms than uh, they did in comparison classrooms. And you can see that in the first panel. Um, at the beginning, um, LMR and comparison EL students performed very similarly. But over the course of the various assessments, there was a clear difference in learning curves. So this was initial evidence that LMR kids, uh, EL kids were doing much better with this revised new curriculum. Um, a second claim was that in LMR classrooms, ELs, or English learners, gained at similar rates as English proficient students. This was important to us because, in general, the gap between English proficient and English learners widens over time, but um, these findings in the second uh, panel just within LMR classrooms, we see at the beginning, in, at the pre-assessment, there was a gap between English proficient students and, and English learners, but by the end of the assessment, there, was, there were no significant differences between these groups. In the final claim that LMR narrowed or eliminated the pre-test achievement gap, we see in the third panel. So when, when, you, when we compare EL students in LMR and EP students in the comparison classrooms, we see at pretests there's this well-known achievement gap between the two groups. But by the end, we see that uh, the situation has uh, really attenuated, that there's no difference in the performance between ELs in LMR and EPs in comparison classrooms. And even at the post-assessment, the ELs were doing much better than the, than the EPs. So, um, we take these findings as being very promising, and uh, importantly, these findings with this integers and fractions measure was corroborated with the uh, California State Assessment Measure, a standardized test. Um, so I want to step back now um, and talk a little bit about the design-based research approach that we used. Um, so the design-based research approach has two parts to it, a lesson design approach and a research approach. Uh, the lesson design approach, again, focuses on integers and fractions as an important core uh, part of elementary mathematics. Um, the general critique um, of math elementary mathematics education today is that it's a mile wide and an inch deep, meaning many, many disparate topics are covered. Um, but those topics are not covered in any depth uh, to support real understanding, by, for many students anyway. The result is an incoherent kind of experience for many kids in, in, in classrooms. So in our approach, we made use of the number line as a central representational context to link two domains that are often treated separately, but are really both parts of the idea of rational number. Um, we also then focused on several four design principles in designing our lessons. Eliciting student thinking, building on students' ideas. This is a sort of a core, all of these principles you'll recognize as just core ideas in research and theory and in mathematics instruction. A second is provoking intellectual conflict and engaging students in communication, analysis, and conflict resolution. Um, a third is differentiating instruction in shared mathematical contexts, meaning that all students, whether you're English learners or English proficient, or whether you're previously high in achievement or low in achievement, are participating in the same lessons, but those lessons have anchors for, all of, for diverse groups. And finally, coordinating representations, whether visual, embodied, verbal, and written, around the same kinds of mathematical problems, so that representations are integrated and corroborate, support one another. The research strand focuses on student learning, with a particular concern for integers and fractions on, as represented on number lines. Um, there's certainly important work that's been done on rational number, but in general, it lacks an integrative focus, using the number line as a key representation. Um, the number line is simply just understudied in this educational context. So there are three kinds of studies we conducted in this research uh, uh, program. One are interview studies, interviewing students about some key problems uh, related to integers and fractions. Tutorial studies in which we explored 
productive learning trajectories that in one-on-one -on -one tutorial interactions seem to support students in productive ways, and a third classroom studies in which we created blueprints for lessons based upon our interview and tutorial studies, um, and then worked with collaborating teachers to design whole class lessons. So the, the big idea here is that um, the research informed our generation of lessons, and at the same time, our lessons created a context for to pursue new kinds of research questions. So I'm going to start off with just describing some interview studies, just to give you a sense, or one interview study, or a couple of problems from an interview study. A key distinction for the interview studies is that we distinguish between routine problems and non-routine problems. So a routine problem might be something like this. Mark the missing number on this number line. The idea is that in this kind of problem, students might need to or might be coordinating linear units, that is units of length, with numerical units, that is counting numbers or uh, the ordinal n number series. Um, but the problem is you really can't tell if a student gives the answer three whether the student is using simply the, la the, the next whole number in a series or whether there's a coordination of linear units and numerical units. For non-routine problems, we typically present number lines with unequal intervals. So in this case, if, the, if a student says, um, with as many students too, the next number is two, we learn something about the kid's thinking. That is, the student is not courting numerical and linear units. Um, yeah, I maybe need a little more time, we'll see. Yeah. Um, so here's an example of an interview study. Um, we see three number lines. On the left column, you'll see um, the first problem is, presents a unit interval. The second problem contains a multi-unit interval, the distance between seven and nine. And again, the third problem contains a multi-unit interval. For the, for the first problem, we find that many students get this problem right. 90% of fifth graders who we interviewed, and we interviewed about 30 students, produced this answer, an appropriate answer. But for the next problems, you see something quite different. So for the next problem, seven and nine mark 11. Very few students, or qu only a quarter of the students marked 11 here. Most students did something like this. They treated the multi-unit as if it were a unit and counted 10, 11. And the same with the next problem. You know, few students got this correct. They treated the multi-unit as a unit and marked 10 after the number, um, instead of doing something like, uh, most students did this as opposed to the, the prior uh, solution. So a next uh, um, part of our design-based research approach was conducting tutorial studies. And we used something we called a communication game in this study. Um, a big idea, there were two really two features that were, that were central to the, this game idea. First, we made use of Cuisinier rods in, in, in this study. Um, rods um, have, could be used to serve different functions in kids' mathematical activity. First, rods could be just treated as physical objects, but they could also be treated as natural units of length. So, um, Here's a situation where uh, rods could be, you know, one could create a linear, linear ray and call it three red rods, the length of three red rods. But rods could also be used as measuring tools uh, for, um, for number line units when at least two points on a number line were labeled. So here's a situation where two and six are labeled on a number line and a rod could be used as a measure of the distance between two and six and become a multi-unit of four. And so you could, you could um, displace the rod to the, or translate the rod to the right to find 10, or translate the rod to the left and find negative two. Um, a second design feature of the game was the introduction of what became definitions and principles uh, that were recorded on an agreement sheet. In this game, um, there's a pile of cards that have problems on them. They're turned over one by one. And the, the student in the game has a number line on a physical piece of paper. And the tutor in the game has a transparency in which the, each the student and the tutor are both supposed to construct the point that's 
that's signaled by the problem card, like mark the length of three reds on the number line. So as the game proceeds, a screen is put down between the tutor and the student, and the tutor can actually peer over the screen, but the kid doesn't know that, um, and they both make constructions. Um, so this, the child might construct three, but the, in, the endpoints of the three rods are not concatenated with, with one another, and the tutor creates a line, uh, point on his or her paper, which does present three in, in its appropriate, the point for three in its appropriate place. The screen is turned up, the student is given the tutor's transparency, lays it over their line, and if there's a disagreement, as there would be in this case, they say, hmm, what can we agree upon so that in the next problem we can uh, get the same point placed? And so an agreement is created on the agreement sheet, um, like counting numbers should be the same distance from one another. And so this goes through 12 or 13 iterations of these problems with a series of agreements being generated, and for each subsequent problem, the tutor and the student face this conflict, often face this conflict, and there's an issue of negotiating an agreement, um, and um, the student then can use those prior agreements to help support creating a point where they match the tutors. Um, so what we found was that um, we'd used a control group and this experimental group. We found that gains were reflecting a very large effect size between the control and experimental group. And we also found that the appropriate agreement use when um, students uh, were solving problems uh, that they would be discussing agreements was associated with very strong gains in, um, in the students. So, um, some reflection about what went on in the tutorial led to this kind of um, model. When kids are presented with the initial problems in a tutorial, something like this, they have access to various kinds of actions, like ordering, splitting, displacing, but often don't make use of these actions or don't coordinate these actions in solving problems like this. Um, when the tutor engages students with creating agreements, the tutor supports using these kinds of actions in making sense of the definitions and principles or agreements that are supported in the lesson, and in turn, those definitions and principles the student uses to coordinate their actions in producing solutions on the line. So ordering actions you know, from left to right, splitting actions to create a fractional part of the, of the interval distance, and displacing actions to create a number. So classroom studies, moving on very quickly, um, the design of the preliminary lessons were guided by the design principles that I articulated earlier, and uh, the interview and tutorial studies that I just described. Um, we uh, re refined lessons in discussions with collaborating teachers, and then we went through a protracted process of refining and re-refining lessons as we observed and coll collaborated with teachers in, in, in talk. Okay, just quickly to move to um, the lesson structures that were used throughout the lessons. Uh, for, every, for almost every lesson, we used a five-phase structure in which students were initially presented with opening problems, two or three problems of the sort that I've described, like Mark 10, given the seven and nine intervals. Um, and these opening problems, kids did independently and were used to sort of initiate them into what was going to be the topic of, of, the, of the class today. Then there was an opening discussion. Teachers had been roving around the room as kids were solving these opening problems, and this was an opportunity for students to voice their way of solving these non-routine open, opening problems, and often teachers would introduce definitions as trying to um, uh, uh, help kids think about in, in, in useful ways uh, problem solutions. Partner work Kids worked in groups, they were given worksheets that contained similar problems to the opening problems, but somewhat more difficult. Um, there was a closing discussion, again, which sometimes teachers introduced definitions and principles and trying to bring the class to some re resolve. And finally, closing problems that gave teachers some insight about were kids making progress through, through the lessons. Um, just some quick uh, video on um, the introduction of definitions and what that looks like in a lesson. Oh, 
that's, that's after I get through talking a little bit about the lesson series. So the lesson series um, covers, just real quickly, positive integers um, with five lessons that go through some of the very basic notions of integers. Another um, three lessons that, it, that carry forward principles established with positive integers into negative integers. Um, quickly review lesson where the definitions and principles introduced in the prior lessons are brought um, are reviewed and talked about in novel pr with novel and review problems. Then for the fractions lessons, fractions are introduced initially as part whole relations um, through five different lessons. Then we move to multiplicative relations, like the, uh, the multiplicative relation between numerators and denominators, uh, equivalent fractions, and we end with uh, review lessons uh, and, and review the definitions and principles that have been discussed throughout the lessons. I'm going to rush, and you can ask questions uh, later. So the number line definitions, that's what I was going to say before. So again, in the opening discussions and closing discussions, um, definitions and principles were introduced. Um, and you can see that these are recorded on a poster in the classroom so that students always have access to them. Um, uh, this is an enlargement of the poster. And you can see in the integers lessons, there are about three, six, nine um, definitions introduced. And in the fractions lessons, another five are introduced. Um, and here's an example of the introduction of uh, the the definition of an interval. And what you'll see in this little short video is that the teacher initially presents instances of um, like ostensive definitions of an interval on a number line for the class, uh, and then moves to the definition of an interval um, and engages students in a similar kind of process. Show me with your fingers. Let's see. It should play. Show me with your fingers. Show me how far that is. Good. I'm seeing that you see it's three. One, two, three. That is an interval of three. From one to four is an interval of three. That's another big word that you need to know. An interval is a distance on the number line. Any distance so there is, is an interval. The this interval happens to be an interval of three. What's this interval? In your mind, in your mind, in your mind. What's that interval <coughs> from three to five? Show me with your fingers. Show me, show me, show me. Show so me. kids are now yes, identifying an instances. Of two. What is this interval? So it goes on. Um, so quickly, um, I want to shift to now um, an entailment of the definition of interval, a unit interval, and the way the teacher introduces that. Special kind of interval. There's a special kind of interval that's the most important one that we've got to learn on a number line. It'll help us unlock the secrets of all number lines. It's that one right there. How much is that interval? One. one. There's a special name for that kind of interval. Unit. Say it. Unit. And it means a distance of one. The same distance that's between zero and one. That's an interval of one. We call that the unit interval. So that's a unit interval. I'm going to see right if there. I could just move on just because I know I'm running late. So let me end with just some conjectures about sources of the efficacy findings. Um, so, so we saw the findings initially, and now um, we can't identify one single factor that led to EL success and, and e English proficient student success. But we believe, uh, after a lot of ob observation of different kinds of kids' participation in the classroom, that three features of these lessons really supported some equity of learning opportunities for kids from both language backgrounds. First, the, the number line supported coordinated treatment of integers and fractions um, across the lessons. 
the lesson structure um, um, that supported design principles also appeared to be very useful for teachers as well as for students. The lesson series supported continuity of representations across the two important mathematical domains. And the definitions in agreement appear to support a common ground for students from different kinds of backgrounds and talk and action to put forth arguments, defend arguments. Uh, so um, I'll end there. Uh, I think I'm out of time. Um, if you're interested in the project, um, you can find this website, basically the lessons to download, as well as descriptions of, of the research. And you can also contact me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now questions? Um, Anna. Um, thank you very much for the talk. And I'm curious, when you say introduce definition, it looks like that actually the definition is given an action. So what is given is a term, interval, and the rest is not like we used to read in our books. Mm -hmm. Interval is bam, 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 right. bam. Yeah, but it's like an action definition, or is it? Uh, so is it like a special understanding of a definition? Just come. Yeah, in definition. philosophy, in epistemology, there is, um, you know, the terms for ostensive definitions, where you point to something, and that isn't that becomes a definition. Um, and then there's the analytic presentation of a definition, which is a formal definition. And we go, we appreciate that for students, not unlike you know, Vygotsky long, long time ago, argued that learning occurs in two directions. From the top down, you begin with a so-called scientific concept introduced in formal instruction, and the big problem is to ascend to the concrete, to a particular instance, to apply it in a particular instance. And also, learning pr proceeds from the bottom up. You have lots of different instances, and you need to put them together in a, in a general idea. So basically, this kind of approach, which we use throughout the lessons of navigating through instances to formal definitions, formal definitions to instances, I think reflects you know, sort of this Vygotskyan kind of concern, um, and also seems to be very productive um, in supporting understanding in kids. Thank you. I will ask a question sure. about teacher education. So it about, seems about that teachers have to understand uh -huh. deeply uh -huh. yeah. the principles of this curriculum and the use of uh, manipulatives. Um, so, and not to replace the lengths by color, for example. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yeah. how yeah. do you prepare teachers for this? So what do you think yeah. the principles of teacher education? Yeah, so, um, so I only said a little bit about the, the project. So we engage teachers, the um, 11 teachers who are participants in the LMR. First, two of the teachers we collaborated with um, in developing the lessons through our iterative re refinement procedure. And so they became, we worked with them intensively, so they became very knowledgeable about the lessons. They were in part, you know, they in part created the lessons with us. And then we ran an institute for teachers in which we had videotape of these teachers implementing the lessons, and we created a teacher's guide to the lessons, which included lots of things, like the kind of understandings that many students had when they were trying to solve each kind of problem linked to each lesson. Mm -hmm. and we had a very thick teacher's guide with each lesson, kind of student thinking that they could expect to see in the classroom, and perhaps moves that they could make to support conflict in resolution, and ways in which um, to introduce definitions that we found productive. So this was not simply handing teachers a manual and saying, go out and teach the lessons. The, there was a lot of professional devel development devoted Thank to you. this. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned you used uh, some tests to measure uh, uh, pupils' achievements. Yeah. Which kind of tests uh, do, did you yeah. Using uh, as a final assessment in uh, interim assessment. Yeah. And so, um, those of you who have quantitative backgrounds, we made use of item response modeling as a particular technique in which we had 
um, an integers and fractions assessment that we created that were, were drawn from items in standardized tests used in the United States, um, as well as items that we designed ourselves, as well as items we pulled from the textbook that um, the comparison classrooms were using. And then we created uh, probably 40 different items, um, and then we had 18 items that were common to the pretest, the interim test, the post test, and the final test. And the other items, say on a 30 item test, shifted over those different assessments that reflected the shifting, um, uh, that reflected shifting difficulty of items. This way, and then we used item response modeling to um, create basically an interval scale over a scale that's really an ordinal scale. Um, and um, the transformation that item response model uses, is a, this is really quite technical, is in logits. And so we avoided ceiling effects at the final assessment and floor effects at the initial assessment by using this four uh, assessment procedure. So that's how we created the, this particular instrument for integers and fractions. And in this assessment, we had, say, number line items and items that didn't contain number lines. And we would then, we were able to compare, did students' performance on number line items differ from non-number line items in the, this core curriculum? And anyway, we found no difference. That ex except the English learners, I should say, we did find an effect that though they did well on, after through the final assessment on the um, non-number line items, they did better on the number line items. For the English proficient students, there was no difference on the number line and non-number line items, and we, we expect that that was different d due to the representation that was more accessible to the English learners. Um, so then we also had this California State Standardized Assessment that was administered. The effects were pretty much corroborated that I just reported to you on the standardized assessment that we had no control over. And yeah. Uh, thank you so much for this very interesting presentation. I would like you to return to your um, uh, activity you present and communication activity. Uh, uh, when students um, put some three red roads yeah. in some kind of uh, way not touching each other, not Should one. I get back, back to that yeah. slide? Or? No, no, it's, yeah, it's okay. okay. Um, uh, uh, in my head, what um, working with students, I think it's my hypothesis that uh, students putting this way uh, the roads, they um, think about the situation kind of uh, counting way. Mm -hmm. They do not realize probably the uh, proportional, uh, the, the proportional vision of the situation. Uh, for your opinion, uh, this communication activity you designed, uh, does it allow for the student to go from this additive way and counting way of seeing the situation towards proportional vision of the situation, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I suppose, uh, was kind of target in uh, this learning? Mm -hmm. Or maybe it happens after or how? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I prefer to think about that particular problem that you're pointing to is not so much about proportionality, but about the idea of a metric unit like a linear unit, like a unit of length, as opposed to a counting number or an ordinal number, like counting one, two, three. And I think that captures what you're saying. Um, so let me say a little, step back a little bit about what you're saying and then move into what you're saying. So in the initial problem that we have, um, we appreciated there, there was a power relation between us, the tutors, and the students, right? We're much older, we, more knowledgeable and that kind of thing. So for the initial problem, like put out three, put out the distance of three reds, um, what the tutor does is he puts the reds to the left of zero, not to the right of zero, as is our convention with number lines. I, maybe in Israel it's different. I don't, I don't know. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so there's a disagreement. Not only may the, the reds not be tightly concatenated with one another, but for the tutor, it goes to the left of zero, not to the right of zero. So there's, a there's automatically a disagreement. And so there's a negotiation to create an agreement, and it's an agreement involving the convention of order. 
that numbers get greater as they go from left to right. And so the tutor bows to the student because the student typically virtually every time puts numbers, puts the rods to the right of zero. So this is an initial introduction to the idea of agreements where the tutor first um, ac acquiesces to the child in, in, in creating this agreement. Then the issue of the concatenation. Yes, many students are counting red rods as opposed to thinking of rods as units of length. And so this becomes an explicit agreement that we need to treat rods as units of length. And most students, um, many students, do the uneven concatenation at the beginning, but will move to agreeing that, that these rods need to be cat concatenated. How deep that understanding is, you know, is a, is, a, is a question mark. But at least many students then make use of that in the sub subsequent problems in, in the tutorial. Okay, thank you. I think that we going out of time, so last question. I noticed that you are using the Cuisinart rods uh, without um, markings of the, in the units that they are constituted of. How yes. I, I Although they are marked by color. Right? Yes, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, just yeah. color. Yeah. Uh, but we know, of course, that uh, this on the number line is not just a, a, a length, but it's also having numbers inside it, how to put it. When you try to, to go from the unit, uh, as he uh, described it, the teacher, uh, unit uh, is um, uh, um, distance of one, uh, and then you go to the unit that is a red rod, that is uh, comprised of number two, mm. how do you do it, I mean, how do you introduce one being two or three or four? Mm -hmm. if you, uh, yeah, so in the, less, so in, in the lessons themselves, not, not the tutorial study, in the lessons themselves, of course, there is this problem that you were pointing to. The rods, if they're used in a stereotypical way, uh, um, a red rod always means two, for, for, for example. But we, we shift the, the length of, of a unit um, in the course of number lines. So some, sometimes um, a, uh, a unit is a red rod. Sometimes a, a unit, the distance between zero and one, is a yellow rod. So this is constantly shifting, and so the rods being confused as simply colors versus rods as relative units relative to other rods becomes a really important part, both of professional development as well as how, how it gets used in lessons. So thank you very much. My pleasure. It was a great presentation. Oh, can I great do one more thing? Um, let's see. I am going to... Hmm, let's see. So I'm going to present another talk um, on Friday after the conference, and it's about another kind of linear system that's used by a very remote Papua New Guinea group. People use the body parts to count, um, and to represent number. There are 27 body parts in this system. I read a book about the social history of this number system. Um, the talk is on Friday. That's where it is. Um, there's a website about this, about this work, um, and it's received a lot of critical attention in, in the United States, so I hope some of you can show up for that. So Thank you so much. Thank you.